What is your number one goal in life? A little light question to start the day. <laughs> What's your primary goal? People have lots of different answers. Some people will say that it's to pursue happiness. Some people will say that it's um, to seek love. Some people will talk about it being um, to fulfillment of their careers, some, some career-related goal that they have. And um, what is your question? What is your answer to that question? What's your primary goal? Some people will say it's comfort. Other people will talk about that it's, um, again, to have fun or to be married or to raise a family or to be popular or all these different kinds of answers that people will give. But the reality of it is all of us in this room have an answer to that question, either explicitly or implicitly in how we live. We all have an answer to that. And it's important because it affects how we operate and how we live life and what we do with it. Someone calls you up and says, hey, uh, you know, I'm going out tonight. Let's go out. And if you're all about fun, you're like, you don't even care what 8 a.m. in the morning is. You're like, I'm in. And if you're about um, comfort, you're like, eh, you know, I was thinking about PJs and the TV tonight, you know. Or if you're about, ultimately about living a safe, secure life, you're like, how late are you going to be out? Or if you're about popularity, you're about, like, who's going to be there? What are we doing? And all these kinds of things. So all of us have got some answer in us and how you tick, what makes you go and what you do and how you answer and how you live. You've got some goal, whether it's explicit or implicit, you have one. And I want to do a slight shift and ask a, a related question, but a different question. And that is to ask, what are the sacred writings that we believe have this divine human um, thing behind it, what, it, what does scripture say about this question? And there are lots of, I think there are many different ways that scripture answers this consistently. We can look at lots of different verses. I want to just point for a moment to start with, with one verse from 1 Corinthians. We didn't read it, but it's from 1 Corinthians um, 14, 1, where it says, make love your primary aim. Scripture's answer, and it's going to say this in many places in many ways, but make love your primary aim. It's not about status. It's not about money. It's not about all the stuff you have. It's not about the popularity, all the stuff we mentioned. It's ultimately about love, the whole lock, stock, and barrel, the whole thing. And we might ask, well, why is that? And the way I would answer that is, is from our first reading today that um, God is love, and ultimately God wants us to be like him. That's why this is all about love. It's all about love. We are the beloved of God. We're made as an object of God's love. And um, I was reading a commentator on this the other day, reading a, uh, something on this, and he was saying, you know, if, if, God's, if God's goal in all, all of this was just to populate heaven so he could have his minions around or whatever it is, he, would have, he could have just done that. But instead, he gave us free will, and he's called us to learn and to practice what it means to love in the midst of a broken world. And that maybe that's part of the reason, if not the main reason, that we're here on this planet is to learn to love. We can have lots of debates and discussion about that. Here's what I do know for sure. Jesus is walking down the road one day teaching in his public ministry, and he has this young, I picture him as young, sort of confident lawyer who comes to him and says, these, you know, we have all this scripture, we have all these sacred writings, we've had to memorize them, there's all these oral traditions and all this stuff we've carried. What do you think is the biggest thing? It's like a thousand pages in our Bible. What's the most important thing of it? And Jesus turns to it and says, look, all of that, 1,000 pages, two things. Love God, love everyone. Two things. If you get those two things, you've got it. If you love God with everything and you love everyone, you've got it. That's it. And it's a huge thing, right? This is a huge thing. This is, to me, this is it. Jesus summarizes it. It's these two things. This is like if, if, if I did nothing else in all of ministry than to teach these two things, this would be it. And I love that our presiding bishop has really 
um, drilled down on this. Like he, he, he's got a lot of great statements on this, but he's devoted this year telling us we need to be about love. He's got this statement that he says again and again, if it's, if it's not about love, it's not about God. This is the deal. I mean, this is at the heart of what's going on with Christianity and with God's um, interaction with us is all about love. And to quote another passage of scripture that's a couple chapters after the one I just quoted, um, we get this passage where Paul is finishing up his first letter to the Corinthians, this church that he loves, and he tells them as he's winding up, he tells them, um, in, this is in 1 Corinthians 16, 14, he says, make everything, everything is about love. Do everything in love. That's what it says. Do everything in love. Everything. And here's where the rubber really hits the road, I think, on Christianity. It's like do everything in love. It doesn't matter what you're thinking of, what relationship, what context it is. Do everything in love. Last week, a week ago today, I was coming. I, I got to go skiing last week, and I was heading into the uh, turn of the car at the Denver airport, and um, um, I drive in there, and there was some, a little bit of confusion on the signs. I really don't think there was that much confusion on the signs, <laughs> but I drove in, and, and the and the rental car attendant came up to me and said, "Yeah, you've parked in the wrong place," and I kind of told him smartly, "No, I didn't. Your signs are not very good." And I got on the plane, and I, started, I was working some more on my sermon. I was sitting there the whole time going, did I respond to that guy in love? <laughs> That's the real challenge, right? Everything. Do I have to think about how to love the rental car clerk that was a little snippy with me? Yeah, I do. Do I have to think about the people that are around me that I work with from the highest to the lowest about love? I do. Do I have to think about the person who is at a political extreme from me, that I want to tell them they're nuts, yeah, i got to love them. That's, what, that's where this thing really gets real and gets tough. And it's something that's really hard for us to do. And I'm going to talk a little bit in the last part of the sermon about a little bit more about how we do that. But we've got to love every, We've got to love our enemies. We have to love people of other faith. We've got to be about love. This, later this week, we're going to have a forum on Thursday night that's a multi-faith, um, the Abrahamic faith um, leaders are going to be in our church. And I'm just reminded of whoever comes to that event, we're supposed to love them. It doesn't matter that they're of a different faith. It doesn't matter. We're called to love them the way Jesus would. We're going to talk about that next week. But we're meant to be about love. And I, I, don't want, I want to tell you one more thing on this before we head to the next part of the sermon. Um, one of the great joys of my life was um, a number of years ago, I got to serve at a church in London for the year. And I won't go into the circumstances, but I kind of got ushered in to this huge church, 2,000 plus people on a Sunday, and I got dropped in to be the head of their school of theology while I was still in seminary. And um, I got to, every Saturday, we had 90 students. I got to host a professor from Oxford or Cambridge or from some big place, somebody big almost every single week. Still can't believe the church let me do that. And, uh, but one, this one Saturday, the speaker was the Bishop of London. So the Bishop of London. And I don't know if you know it, the Bishop of London is the bishop who's in charge of missions throughout the entire world for the Anglican Church. I mean, like when it's coming out of England anyway, that's the way it is. And um, he was, I don't even remember what he was speaking on directly, but he, he got up and told the students at some point, and he told me this when I had coffee with him later, he said, you should try to memorize as much scripture as you can because the Holy Spirit will use that. The Holy Spirit will bring it to mind it, to you at the right time. The more you've learned, the more it'll come up, the more the Holy Spirit will use it to continue to mold, mold you. And I know for those of us who've lived in the South, some of, some of us have been beat up by the Bible and from other places, and we're like, no, that's from somewhere else. But this is the head of the Anglican Church in London and throughout the world, in a sense, in the missions, saying, the more we memorize, the better. So I want to challenge you on this. We, this sermon series is five weeks. I want you to memorize one passage of Scripture. I want to challenge you to think about writing this on a post-it note for five weeks and put it on your mirror and look at it while you're brushing your teeth and think about what it means. But this, uh, this passage that I just read from 1 Corinthians 16, 14, do everything in love. Just write that verse down. Do everything in love. And put it on your mirror and begin to think about what that means and how you treat people. It's more than the golden rule. 
It's beyond that. It's everything that we do, and it'll change us. Everything. Because God is love, and he wants us to be like him. And that will affect every single relationship we have. And that's what we're talking about in these five weeks. Today, I'm just talking about how the main thing about everything is love. And I want to pivot here and begin to think about, now, how do we do that? Because it's really difficult, right? And the beginning place to think about that, whether we're loving somebody who's hurt us or done, betrayed us or done what, whatever, when you go to those deep, dark places where people are unlovable or doing lovable acts, how do we love them? The very first thing we should think about is this whole thing begins because God loved us first, as we learned in 1 John. We love because God loved us first. We, we, we're not able to give away what we don't have. We receive from God. He loves us first. And the more we take that on board, the more we're, we're able to give it out in the world. And so we love because God loves us. And, and the secret, I think, to going deep in love is to continue a process of taking more and more of God's love into us and deeper, in deeper ways and deeper places. If we can know, like sometimes we'll get people who'll say, you know, people who struggle with guilt or people who think I'm not good enough or they, all these different kinds of things. All of that goes away if we begin to realize what it means to be so deeply the beloved of God. Today at our, at our offertory, um, Justin is going to sing a song that I requested that was written by a music leader down in Waco and it became a huge hit in the contemporary Christian world. But it, it was, uh, it's a song about how much God loves us. And the more we take on board how much God loves us, we begin to realize we have this incredibly strong foundation and base and gift that allows us to go into the brokenness of the world and minister. Forgiving ourselves. Realizing we're good enough. God, you know, I was talking to Dr. Power yesterday. I love the guy. We were talking about something else, and Dr. Power said, we were chatting, and he said, he just kind of like paused in the middle of this conversation and said, you need to stop and, and just think about how God knows you better than you know yourself and still loves you. It's this, this deep sense of it doesn't matter what you've done, what's going on, anything else. If you can just take that, that around you, how much God loves you, it'll make it easy for you to love God. It'll make it easy for you to share love. Because you're not looking for an exchange that says, are we 50-50? Have you been good to me? I'll be good to you. It's not that. It allows us to step out in grace and say, you've treated me, rental car clerk, poorly. <laughs> and I want to give you better than you deserve. Because that's what's at the heart of grace and at the heart of this kind of love. It takes us to a deeper place. And it allows us to have more patience and more love and all these other things. And my prayer for you during these five weeks is that you will experience, we're going to do a few things in here to try to do this, but that you will experience God's love in a deeper way so that you can share it. And part of that is recognizing that all of us in this room have been injured in life. And I don't care how young you are. We've all had some hurts and things that will impact how we love. I, saw, I haven't read this book, but I, I saw this up the other day, this title of this book, and I want to read it just because of the title. I'll, I'll report back to you in time. But the title of this book was Love Like You've Never Been Hurt. And I thought, oh, man, I want to read that. That is such a great title. And I think that's part of the healing process. When, as we go deeper in God's love, the more we find God's healing, again, the easier it is for us to love. I saw a commentator who talks about this who, who said we're all like a tube of toothpaste. That, that when we finally get squeezed and pressured, whatever we are on the inside is what's going to come out. And our job, in part, is to try to work on what's on the inside. Because if we're judgmental and we feel like we're not good enough, and we're all about guilt because you know, God's got guilt, and all that, whatever it is, all that kind of stuff, that's what we're going to give out. But if we go deep into God's love, if we get a hold of how we're the beloved, that God knows all that stuff and loves us anyway in ways we can't imagine. It's, we get under pressure. We're going to be more like Jesus on the cross who's being betrayed and killed and all this stuff. And he's forgiving the people doing it. You know, Deep stuff that we can give out. The t so that's the first thing. The, the, there are two other things really quickly that I want to do. One is to talk about how love ultimately is a choice and a commitment. 
And we can talk about this. I'm not going to talk a whole lot in this sermon series about romantic love and this and so on and so forth. But this idea that whatever kind of love we're talking about, part of it's always going to involve us choosing and committing. And that's the way it is. Because think about this for a minute. You know, if Jesus says to the lawyer that day, the greatest command is to love God and love, love everyone. He's not saying, well, if you're infatuated and you feel like it, do this. Hope that works out. He tells him straight up, love God. It's like a command. So it's like a choice. And it's something we follow through on. Love God, love everyone. That it, We put it out there. And elsewhere we see other examples of this in Scripture. You think about like in Deuteronomy 30, 20, where it's like choose life and choose to love God and choose this stuff. You're, it's a choice and a commitment to do it. So reflect on that as well. And the final thing I want to say today, we'll, I've got more things to say on how we do this. We're going to pick up with those next week, and we're going to talk about a little bit about looking at the model of how Jesus loved and how we, what we take from that. But the final thing I want to say, is, beside it being a choice, is that love involves action. And you can think of, there are lots of passages that will go into this. You can think about, for example, um, 1 John 3, 18 talks about, don't just love with words or with your tongue, but by actions. And maybe, some people will tell you that maybe the greatest love you can have in your day-to-day -day life is when you give loving actions even when you don't feel like it. And uh, I've got a... I've got a 10-week-old puppy in my house right now. And I love the dog, but, it, but it's bringing back lots of memories of having a newborns in my house, you know, the tag team twins when they were little. And, um, but nobody gets up at 3 in the morning to change a big poopy diaper because they feel like it. You do it ultimately because it's an action you do even though you don't feel like it because you're committed and you're choosing to love. And I think again and again we get examples like that. You know, you come home tired from work and you realize your most important ministry is to your spouse or to your, chil your children and the love you've got to give even when you're exhausted. It's a choice you're going to make. You pull up in the driveway and say, maybe the most important part of my day is beginning right now and I'm exhausted. God, give me some of your love and your energy and I'm going to come in and here and do this. It's an action thing, right? It's an action thing. And we got to pray for that and do that. So lots to think about on this series. I really hope you'll join us for all of it. If you're traveling and you're not able to make one of the Sundays, we're changing the way we're doing our videos now. So we're not live streamed, but by about 4 or 5 in the afternoon on a Sunday, it'll be up on the web. So if you're out traveling and you miss a Sunday, pick up the one you miss because we're going to keep trucking through these five weeks. We're going to have one little intermission in the middle where Eric is going to do a lectionary sermon. But so over the next six weeks, we're going to do all these different topics, and I hope you'll make plans to join us for all of those. I want to invite you to close your eyes as we pray, and I, I want to lead us in a little bit of a guided prayer for just a moment. I want you to, um, as you close your eyes, I want you to picture that Jesus is before you, and he's looking at you. And I want you to imagine that he looks at you, and I want you to think for just a moment. Hopefully this isn't bringing up too much pain, but I want you to think of the thing you're most embarrassed about, the, most, the thing you're most ashamed of. And I want you to picture Jesus telling you, yeah, I know that. I know that. And I want you to see him embrace you and say, but I love you. I've always loved you, and I will always love you. And I want you to hear him say, You've got, you, I've always got your back. I've always got that love for you, and I want you to share it. Amen.